The following is an analysis, interpretation, and summary of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Chapter 18, The Truth About Talent. So now we are into the last three chapters of Atomic Habits. This, these last three chapters will focus on advanced tactics, how to go from good to great. So now we've mastered the foundations, the fundamentals, the principles. Now we're going to talk about some other extraneous uh, subjects and topics, you know, on genetics and environment, for example. So now it's the topic of, well, how do we maximize our success in a given field that suits our own biological framework? Because you can pick fields for yourself that aren't actually predisposed or you aren't predisposed to be particularly skilled at or have the ideal character traits personality traits for i am an example of this i fell in love and i chose the discipline to dedicate myself solely to something in my life when i was a teenager and that was basketball i wanted something where i feel i could be worthy at good at i felt like i was worthless i didn't have anything i was skilled or naturally talented at so i just picked that because of my circumstances and environment predisposed me to that however Later on, after I moved away from it, after I moved away from, you know, trying to take it as far as possible, I realized in reflection that my skill set, my natural aptitude, my genetics were not suited to be ideally, optimally, effectively successful at this game. I was running a constant uphill battle and it makes me think how many other people out there are running that uphill battle too unnecessarily. Yes, you fall in love with something. Yes, you're passionate about it. Yes, you well, you want it really bad, but could you have that same feeling about something else? But this time with the other thing, you feel similar, but you're naturally skilled at it. Your personality is more suited to it. And now you're running downhill instead of uphill. Now momentum is on your side. And after I moved away from basketball, I felt that. I realized that I found the thing. And that's the de my dedication and pursuit to the fundamental understanding of the, hu the science of the human body and its practical applications on how to optimize it for health, longevity, and performance. This is, this is what I dedicate my vocation to. It, it is the major, my major vocation. And when I found that... I'm like, oh man, this communication, leadership, something that has clear defined endpoints and outcomes that weight training and often exercise modalities do, I could be more successful at, more effective at. And then I could lead other people, coach other people to do the same thing, similar thing, if not even better. That's what strength of sad is for those who aren't familiar. You can see it on Instagram and my website if you want. Now, how do we do? Because there's an example. Like, how, how do we maximize our success now? I've given you my my spiel, my story, short, briefly. Like, all right, let's give you a real example. Michael Phelps. He has the ideal body for swimming. Long torso, short legs. Me with basketball was suboptimal. It's, it was my like, even though I am average or slightly above average in height. You have to be very above average in height and ideally muscular size and strength, power, speed, change of direction capabilities, motor control, uh, coordination. I was not that. And it's not that you can't make it if you don't have a natural aptitude towards something. It's just that makes it that much harder and longer. And so there is a cost. The cost is higher because the inputs you have to put in to get to the same outcome as someone else who has a greater amount of talent and skill and genetic potential and personal, better, uh, better personality uh, traits. If the, if the work committed is equated, they will always win. However, there's the quote, talent, when talent fails to work hard, working hard will beat it. But if talent works hard, good luck. You're going to have to work even harder, smarter, more consistent. Michael Phelps is the ideal torso for body, type, 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 uh, torso for swimming. You have marathon runners, they have the ideal uh, limb length of their lower extremities, their legs for running because a longer femur, tibia, lower extremities enables greater stride frequency and stride length particularly. 
So how can we choose things that shift the playing field so we can run downhill instead of uphill? How many people listening to this did uh, chase something or are chasing something that they know that they're fighting a constant uphill battle? Like eventually that battle is gonna you're gonna you're gonna be done with the battle. You don't fight forever, and you're gonna move on to something else. So how do you choose something? And maybe some of you haven't found the thing, but how do you choose the thing that's suited towards your natural aptitude, skills, and talents? Well, you want to play a game where the odds are stacked in your favor. And this is dependent on a, a, a framework of self-awareness about yourself, who you are, what you're good at, what you're skilled at, what you're curious at, and your personality temperament, which we'll talk about soon and how to uncover that. So you want to find the cross-section of something you love, you enjoy doing, something you have a natural proclivity for. I term, uh, I use the term often, ikigai or ikigaya. It's a Japanese term for like your your purpose and ultimate meaning and purpose in life. It's where this, look up the diagram. It's this, it's this beautiful diagram of where curiosity and your vocation and where you can make money and what you're good at and what you're giving back to the world, it all intersects. If you can find that, boy, oh boy. Now, I feel fortunate enough where after enough work and just fighting and battling, I feel like I'm on that path. And I'm very grateful for it because I realize and I look around and you see around the world, you, how many people listening and watching to this, how many people around the world don't feel that? They feel stuck. They're doing something they don't ultimately want to do. It doesn't feed and nourish their soul and heart and mind. And maybe they're 20 years into a family and they feel stuck and maybe they're 40, 50 years old and they feel like their life's over. But if you can look up, you can get up, right? And if you can get up, it means you can get up and do some small action towards something. It doesn't have to be a dramatic change like we've talked about. 1%. We forget that people are at the top of their fields are not only very well trained and experienced, but they're often very naturally suited to their fields. They're, there's always outliers, but we're talking 80-20 Pareto's rule here, meaning 80% of the people are going to be that very well trained, very well suited, naturally have a proclivity for it. Now, it's also a selection bias we have to understand is that the people at the top of their fields usually... The, the, the top of the field biases people who have a natural, who are naturally suited to be successful at the top. Basketball, professional basketball, professional sports, they have a selection bias towards the characteristics that ultimately benefit the success in that said sport. The same thing is for a, a, a lawyer, the same thing is for a doctor. There is certain uh, personality proclivities and traits and characteristics that one that makes one much more that their ability to be successful and effective at that field much higher so you may want nothing more than to become a lawyer or a neurosurgeon or uh, a, a, a study artificial intelligence and, and build the next uh, revolutionary AI but we have to understand that What's theoretical isn't always practical and what you know what you dream may not be the best manifestation of what you could be doing in this world. And just because you love it doesn't mean necessarily you should dedicate your entire life to it, but it also doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't do it. But if you find an outlet like this, this is an outlet for me. This is an outlet for creativity, for philosophy, for psychology, for like my, just how I think about the world. This is, this is an outlet to, for me to communicate my operating system to the world and to, to, to summarize and analyze a lot of these ideas that I'm learning. What if you could get paid to do that? Oh, wait. People do. Now, it's not because of the money. That's just a bonus, but it's possible. People make it. People can do it. But I'm not put, putting all my chips in this basket where it'd be like, I got, I love this. I got to do this. I'm just going to keep analyzing books and just waiting and keep grinding until, until... That's not what I'm trying to do. You can. You could say I have a natural proclivity for it and I may be able to be more successful at it than others, but you have to ask that for yourself. Is the thing you're doing now are you naturally suited? So in this case, 
are we and you selecting the right place to focus? I wasn't so much with basketball, but you, everybody listening and watching has to ask themselves at the end of the day and be honest with themselves. Are we selecting the right place to put our focus? It's okay to do a few things at once, but ultimately like, like you can be the polymath, you can be the Leonardo da Vinci type. You know, we, we've never had, I think, more examples of people who do multiple things and can be successful in multiple modalities. But there's going to generally be a thing you have a naturally proclivity for, and that's where you may want to focus more of your time, particularly in the front end. So you can build a solid foundation of financial security and independence and the systems and the habits and skill towards that. Now let's talk about genes. Something we can't control once we're born, we can only tr control the expression of them, termed epigenetics, through our environment and our behavior. Genes. The area where you are predisposed to success are the areas that are m more likely to be satisfying because we're going to be better at them. So of course you're going to be satisfied and, and feel better about something that you have a natural skill at. The key is to direct your effort towards areas that both excite you and you enjoy and match your natural skills. So this is how we align ambition with ability. So how do we determine where the odds are stacked in our favor? So first, you've got to understand your character, your personality. Most people never bother to ask the question or really learn about themselves. Who are you? Are you just on the treadmill of life, constantly going? Have you stopped to pause and think? Are the beliefs that you hold of your own volition and choice, or are they just a indoctrination of the society, culture, environment, parenting around you? So, let's understand. There is a psychological framework called the Big Five. Many would have heard of from Jordan Peterson. I've referred to before. I've done his 12 Rules for Life for those who are curious on this channel. All 12 rules I've analyzed. Incredible book. Now, all five characteristics have biological underpinnings. We're talking about openness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, and conscientiousness. Uh, Jordan Peterson hosts, you can do this test online, Peterson hosts a test that I would highly recommend. It's a small fee of, what, $10 or something. And you can, it asks you a series of questions, and this is where you test your, where you sit on the spectrum. Let's give some examples. Openness. And this is openness to experience. Are you on the curious and ad to inventive side, or are you on the spectrum that is more cautious and consistent? So we have different ends of openness. We have different ends of all these traits. So ask yourself, are you more curious and inventive? But it's not just the it's not just the, 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 the one word, the characteristic words. It's understanding the implications of them, which the Big Five personality test helps you understand. It helps you understand the types of people, relationships you'd be suited for. It makes you think about, wow, okay, that's how I deal with problems. Oh, now I kind of see why. Well, I may not mesh well with someone who has low on openness. I may mesh well better with someone who's high on the openness spectrum. Oh, why do my relationships keep crumbling beneath me? Why do I keep attracting these types of guys or girls or whatever? You know, oh, I tend to gravitate towards people who are high in neuroticism. They're sensitive to negative emotion. Well, I don't do well with that. Yet, for some reason, I keep gravitating towards those types of people. Why is that? Maybe what if I had more friends and family or, or people in my life that were low on neuroticism? How much less stressful could my life be? These are the questions it makes you think of. Let's go to the next one. Extroversion, introversion. Uh, actually, you can track this from birth. Scientists played loud noises in a nursing ward, and the babies that turn towards the sound are more likely to become extroverted when they test them later in life compared to the babies that look away. Introversion. Agreeableness. Higher agreeableness. So are you agreeable or disagreeable type of person? Okay. When someone says their perspective to you or, or asks you questions or challenges you, do you tend to be like really agreeable uh, and, you know, kind of a yes man or woman? Or are you quite disagreeable and you're always providing that your two cents and your your a uh, counterpoint of view. You know, I probably, I believe I skew on more disagreeableness, okay? Uh, and so that's gonna have implications where if you're with somebody who's really agreeable and you're really disagreeable, that might be a recipe for a bit of conflict. So then you need to communicate that with your partner, with your friends, with your family. Hey, this is, this is my personality proclivity. It's not a, a switch I can flick on and off. 
Please be patient with me. I'm going to do my best here. So higher agreeableness tend to have higher oxytocin levels. Oxytocin being released uh, when we have sex, uh, when we're hugging, when we're uh, intimate affection. And that makes sense because oxytocin uh, and agreeableness, agreeableness is like a, it's more of a positive feeling. Yeah, like, yes, oh yes, yes. It's more of an optimistic feeling generally. Uh, this person may be more influenced to build habits and enforce social cohesion and connection like reaching out to people consistently to talk, writing thank you notes, organizing social events. But they may be more easily preyed on by, for manipula manipulative purposes by other entities. Neuroticism. Uh, neuroticism is your sensitivity towards negative emotion. We could use the news as an example, uh, which, which is very good at stimulating neuroticism in people. But how sensitive or resilient are you to negative emotion? Uh, neuroticism has been linked to hypersensitivity of the uh, amygdala, uh, which uh, functions to notice threats. So if our amygdala, which functions to notice threats, is more hypersensitive, uh, linked to higher neuroticism, sensitivity for negative emotions and threats. So high and low neuroticism, like I, I skew very low on neuroticism, which is fortunate because not a lot bothers me. Not a lot can really get to me. Uh, I'm generally quite calm even in the, in, the, in the face of chaos and like a tornado, you know, I, I can keep my resolve about me through practice, but also uh, natural character trait, I assume, genetics. So you have to be conscious of that. How often, if you're high neuroticism, how often are you putting yourself in situations? How could you manipulate your environment so you're not constantly triggered by negative emotion to feel negative emotion? Conscientiousness. Now, uh, this one is your. There's conscientiousness. There's orderliness. There's industriousness. These are kind of branches from each other. This is your tendency for orderly or disorderly type behavior. Do you take pride in the things you do in this in the actions that you take? How much pride do you take in keeping your environment clean? People who are generally clean and tidy and like things in their place, for example, my bookcase behind me, like I like mise en place, which means a French term for everything in its place. That's quite important to me. I rank very high on conscientiousness. So uh, I'm quite an orderly person. I'm the type of person who's going to have a much easier time forming and maintaining habits, you know, whether it's around cleanliness of a home or a positive environmental design. Compared to someone who's low in conscientiousness, who is going to have a tendency to, to keep their environment a little less clean and more chaotic. They may not care as much due to this character trait. If you high and low conscientious people live together, again, can be another source of conflict. Again, it's not means you can't live together. It means you just have to do a, a more effective, better job at communicating your differences to build a bridge of alignment. So I think it was important to take a little bit of time there and go through that big five because it, it applies to all of us. It's very relevant. Highly encourage you go to check out that uh, personality test. But the takeaway is to understand your own character, then you can understand and have an explanation to why you have an easier time forming some habits and a harder time forming others. This can inform your intervention strategies and shortcomings to control those shortcomings instead of letting them control you. See, information now about yourself is a potential power to gain authority over your own abilities and choose habits that best suit you, not the ones that everyone tells you to do. We're all told and, and, and kind of indoctrinated into certain social cues and behaviors and habits that we should do, and you should get up early. There's been numerous writers, poets, comedians who do their best work at like 2 a.m., under candlelight. And there are numerous people who function really well from getting to bed early and and waking up early. But early bird gets the worm first. Okay. But what's more important when you wake up or what you do when you're awake? <laughs>